Well, the message today for moms, and I think for the church, is a call to greater love. And I'm going to be in John 15, and we'll be looking at verses 9 to 27. Here's the outline today. Greater love is commanded, verses 9 to 12. And then Jesus explains this greater love, verses 12 to 15. And then, surprisingly, the bad news is greater love is hated. And he'll talk about that in verse 18 to 23. And then some encouraging news at the end that greater love is advocated by the Holy Spirit, verses 26 and 27. So let's begin. First, greater love is commanded in John 15, verse 9. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. He's picking up the theme from the previous verses about abiding in Christ. So he's saying, abide in my love. Verse 10, when you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. And then verse 12, this is my commandment, love each other. Now, Father, thank you so much that we can be fed again uh, on the word of God. This is, this is better than, than a brunch, a big, huge brunch. You're, you're feeding us the very words of God. God breathed, Holy Spirit inspired words that 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 steady our soul and minds and, and feed us and equip us and, and help us to live uh, with love as we go about this week. And I pray for your help as I speak, and I pray for help as, as those who listen. And, and may we abide in your love this day. In Jesus' name, amen. So I, I think we can see a, a chain of love mentioned here. First, the Father loves the Son, then the Son loves us, then, then we are commanded to love each other. You know, the Christian ethic goes all the way up to the nature of God. God never commands us to do something that's not true to his nature, true to his character. We, we don't make up right and wrong just out of thin air. Our right and wrong, the, the law, the, the scripture, goes all the way to the character of God. Of God. And so God is love, so love is God's command. But we need to be careful that we don't reduce God to just one thing love. The world likes to do that. God is love, and that's like, like that's all He is. And it's a mistake to reduce Him to one attribute love. Let's remember God is also holy, just, merciful, sovereign, powerful, and unchanging. So when we study God's being, God's attributes, they must be understood together, all of them. And none of God's attributes are more or less present than any others. So think about this. The love of God is also holy and sovereign love. And, and the love of God is also immutable, unchanging, and eternal love. And also God's justice is also loving and eternal. And God's holiness is loving and omniscient, and so on it goes. All of his attributes are there on display at all times. So love must never be separated from the being of God and all his attributes. And this command to love must be informed by all of who God is. So, I want to ask, why does Jesus command love? Well, because love, biblical love, above all, is a matter of the will. It is a matter of the will. It, it, it means to will the good of its object. So love, love is much more than a liver quiver or a goose pimple. It, it is the choices we make every day, in our lives for the good of another. Biblical love is those choices we make every day for the good of another. So when God loves us, he wills what is good for us. 
And when we love others, we, we will and we act for their good. And that means we also have to understand what the word good means, because God is love and God is also good. C.S. Lewis wrote the book Mere Christianity, and he said this about love. Love, in the Christian sense, does not mean emotion. It is a state not of the feelings, but of the will. That state of the will, which we have naturally about ourselves, we must learn to have about other people. So the command is, love each other. It's not an option for the Christian. It is an absolute. And, but notice there's a great benefit for us obeying this command. When we, ob- when we abide in Christ, we're abiding in his commands. And look what else is abiding here. Not just greater love. Verse, verse 11 says, God sends us a greater joy. It all goes together. More abiding in Christ more abiding in his word and in obedience to him, and then he sends to us a greater joy. Well, next, greater love is explained, verse verse 12. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. And there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father has has told me. So Jesus here not only commands greater love, he gives that standard of greater love. And here it is. We are to love each other the same way Jesus loves us. That's a high calling, isn't it? And the word for love here is agape. And agape love and phileo love, that's friendship love. Those those words are actually interchangeable many times. So agape love does also include the the idea of friendship here. It's it's mentioned here in the text. But but C.S. Lewis calls agape love divine gift love. Divine gift love. So... He wrote about that that in this book, Love is Always Right, by Josh McDowell. And here's what he says about uh, divine gift love. Divine gift love, which is the love of God, in reality, the indwelling God of love that is working in us and through us to protect and provide for others. Only God's love can allow us to love anyone and everyone without strings. As C.S. Lewis said, to love what is not naturally lovable. That's, that's divine gift love. That means love for lepers and criminals and enemies and morons and the sulky and the superior and the sneering. That's quite a list. It is, it is to this level of love that Christ calls us when he says, love your enemies in Matthew 5 and love your neighbor as yourself in Matthew 22, and here love each other as I have loved you in John 15, verse 12. That's the standard. Love each other the same way I have loved you. So so Jesus loves us with a divine gift love. That is that in spite of love, that unconditional love, that sacrificial love. and, And we are to love without benefits in in return. I heard Stephen Charnock say this, to, to love God only for his benefits is to love ourselves. To love God only for his benefits is really to love ourselves. And and think about it, when you when you love someone else only for what they do for you, is that really love for them or is that more love for you? <laughs> So divine gift love is is a love without benefits. Christ loved us sacrificially. What benefit did he receive from us by dying on the cross? He gave his life away for us. What did we do for him? (laughs) So that is the, that is the, the standard of love. 
And let's remember uh, God's love is impassable. That's another one of his attributes. That means God doesn't love us more on some days or less on other days. We, we can't understand that. Our, our feelings, our love, it, it comes and goes, doesn't it? Well, God's love doesn't come and go. It, it's steady. It's ongoing. It, it, it is changeless. And even when we've stopped pursuing God, he doesn't, he doesn't stop pursuing us in his relentless love. Kim Katola wrote a book called Cradle My Heart, Finding God's Love After Abortion. And, and Kim, maybe you know Kim, she was inducted in the Minnesota Broadcasting Hall of Fame. She worked for KS95 and WCCO and KTIS Radio. She had a radio show for a while called Cradle My Heart uh, Radio. Well, so in the book, she says she grew up in the church. She knew all about the love of God. She knew all about uh, right and wrong. And, uh, but something happened to her when she was a young, young adult. She, she got, uh, got pregnant, and, and then she was just filled with grief when she realized what she had done in aborting her baby. And she said she could not believe that God could ever love her again. And, and then she said, but when her love failed for her child, God's love did not fail for her or her child. She said, Christ's love in his death on the cross changed everything. Even my thinking and my feelings about my child who is no more. The love of Jesus Christ touched my heart to believe and know that my child lives on, known by God, loved, and forever safe with him. God's gracious act of mercy inspired me in a love I had never known before as one forgiven, as one redeemed, despite what I had done. Jesus not only held a place for me, but he holds my child in heaven. His grace completely captivated my heart. Jesus has cradled the heart of my child in his arms forever, safe in heaven. How could I possibly return this debt of love? Isn't that marvelous? So healing. So I think the only way to, to explain for us to comprehend God's greater love is to keep reminding us of how great God is. If you want to know his greater love, you've got to know how great he is. And, and, and that means to know that God is self-existent. That means his love had no beginning. And to know that God is eternal, that means his love has no end. And, and God is infinite, that means his love has no limit. And God is holy, so his love for us is absolutely pure and transcendent. It, it's a love that's out of this world, which has come to us in Jesus Christ. Well, third, there's some bad news here in this section, and that is greater love is hated. Verse 18, if, Jesus says, the world hates you, that's believers, that's the disciples, remember, that it hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you're no longer part of the world. I, I chose you to come out of the world so it hates you. Do, you. do you remember what I told you? A slave is not greater than the master. Since they persecuted me, naturally they'll persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. And they would not be guilty if I had not come and spoken to them, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Anyone who hates me also hates my father. So, as, as I mentioned before, Jesus promised in John 15 that if we abide in him, we will be fruitful. I like that part. I don't like this part. 
that, that if, we, if we abide in Jesus, we're also inviting the hatred of the world. I don't like that part. Well, why? Because the world hates God the, the Father and, and God the Son. And there's a, there's a chain of, of love coming down from God the Father to Christ to us. But there's also here a chain of hatred, isn't there? Hatred toward the Christian, which is really a hatred of Christ, which is ultimately, Jesus says, a hatred of God. Well, Jesus says there's, there's no excuse for this hatred. But he says, expect it. Even if you're abiding in Jesus and you're close to him and you're a fruitful believer, don't think the world won't hate you for that, for some reason. I wish it wasn't so. So I think when I think of the world and all that's happening, oftentimes I think of 2 Timothy 3, where it gives us a depiction of what the world will be like in the last days. Let me read it for you. In the last days, there will be very difficult times. And here's the reason. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and, and ungrateful, and they will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and forgiving. They will slander. That, that word in the Greek is diablos. So that right in the, the middle of this ugly list of things, you've got the, the devil slander. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and, and love pleasure rather than God. Verse 5, they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Does that, does that not sound like the last days, like the days we're living in now? The part that troubles me is the acting religious. That, that really bugs me. That there's a, there's a kind of a, uh, I'll say it this way, a kind of a self-righteous hatred that has a kind of religious fervor to it that, that the world thinks is so good for the world, but it's, it's horrible. So I think of what has happened to our world in this past, last century, and when I think of that, I think of Karl Marx and his writings, and his theories. And, and Marx, as you know, he, he taught that all the trouble in the world, all the hate in the world was due to one thing, class conflict. Well, that's why people hate each other. The rich, you know, they always oppress people, the poor, and they're always oppressed. So what's the solution? Well, you, these, these, the worker class has to revolt and, and overthrow the capitalist class. And that's really the history of the 20th century. Look at all these nations, many nations, who had some version of a Marxist-type revolution. I was in Phnom Penh. I was in the killing fields when Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge ruined that nation. And I'll never forget it. I was, I was forever changed in that visit <laughs> when I saw what Marxism did to the people of Cambodia. And other nations too, Russia, China, on and on it goes. And what is the result? It, it doesn't solve anything. There, there's more hatred, more death, and more oppression. Some count 140, 180 million dead because of atheist Marxist government action. Well, you say that could never happen here in the U.S. And in a way, it couldn't happen here. At least it couldn't happen before because there, there were too many middle-class people in the U.S. And, and too many people living the American dream at some level or, or another, so you can't really start a class war in America, right? So, but Marxism didn't give up. It went underground. And this is my, this is my opinion through the reading that, that I've done. There's a kind of a neo-Marxism now, 
and it, w- it was cooked up in our, in our universities. And, and we're just now beginning to learn about this new theory. It's called critical race theory. Maybe you've heard of it. And, and it's just, what is it? All, all of a sudden, here it is. Well, well, what is it? Well, my understanding is that it says the whole trouble with the world is, is not a class conflict. It's a race conflict. And so what, what the theory does is it gives a diagnostic tool to tell us who the oppressors are and who the oppressed are. And it's by identity. It's by your identity. So if, if you have a certain identity or certain skin color, you, you're, you're judged an oppressor, period. End of story. Whether you know it or not, <laughs> regardless of who you are or what, how you've lived your life. And, and, and that means the oppressed, whoever they are, according to the theory, they have moral authority to press you back, to make things even. It's called equity. So as we're, as we're learning about this, we're, we're, we're trying to think, well, <laughs> is this going to make things better? It, it seems to me this may be driving even more hate, even more lawless, more and more self-righteousness in the world. And I would think if this kind of thinking abides in our nation, it will lead to more death and more oppression. It will, it will hurt our nation. Now, does Jesus have a theory, a theory for what has gone wrong in the world? <laughs> does Jesus have anything to say about why there's hatred in the world? I, I think he has a theory. And it's not going to be primarily economic. It's not going to be primarily racial or by identity. No, it's going to be theological. It, it, it's, the hatred in, in the world is going to be driven by hatred for God. So, so I would call it here in verse 19, we're seeing a kind of a critical world theory. <laughs> critical world theory. Look, look at what Jesus says here. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it. But you're no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it hates you. So what's, what's the fundamental division? What's the theory Jesus gives for why there is hatred in the world? It's, it, it's between those who belong to the world system and those who do not. That's the animosity that Jesus says will be in the world. It, it's spiritual, it's theological. And that world system is that, that system of lies, that, that narrative, some say it's even demonically organized, that, that, is, that stands against three big ideas. The three big ad- ideas are God, creation, and moral absolutes. That has to be knocked over. They, People see that as oppression. So that has to be knocked over. We don't want a world with God or, or the creation made by God or God-given moral absolutes. We want the world, we want reality to be the way we want it to be. So all of this, which is represented in the teachings of Christ and what the church preaches faithfully through the centuries, is seen now as oppression. And it must be overthrown. It's, that's the division in the world. It's theological. It's a, it's a division over God's view of reality versus man's view of reality. That's my opinion. And I think Jesus predicted that here. That there would be animosity between his followers in the world. So it's because the world does not know God, does not want to know God that in the end it rejects love, the greater love that, that they could enjoy. When I was in high school, I, I memorized 1 John chapter 4, one of the smartest things I did in all my high school years. <laughs> Beloved, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 
So that's, that's the great hostility in the world. And, and I would say this, the great inequity in the world is not about race or class or identity. It's about those who know God and those who don't know God. That is the great inequity in the world. And that's, that's why I wanted to be part of the alliance because today I know there's 700 missionaries out all around the world sharing the love of Christ in places that don't even know the gospel, don't even know about Jesus. That's the inequity I care about most. That some know the love of God and some do not know the love of God. And that's the only cure to the world's hostility. Amen? And God help us to stay focused on the love of God in these confusing and divisive times. So can we end with some encouraging news here? <laughs> Greater love is advocated. How, how, is it, how is it advocated? Verse 26, Jesus says, but I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth, and he will come to you from the Father, and he will testify all about me. And you must also testify about me because... You have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. So Jesus promised he would send us help. And we need help, right? It's the advocate. Who's that? That's the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Just as the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to every believer to fill the church, to help us love as we should. So the Spirit is our advocate for greater love of God and, and a greater testimony to others, even when others don't want to hear about it. <laughs> greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Isn't that a great promise? And as we get to this part of John, chapter 14, 15, and 16, every chapter Jesus talks about the Advocate the Holy Spirit who would come. And he, he's going to say, it's better that I leave because then the Spirit will be in you. The Spirit will be with you. And, and that word there is paraclete. And it means one called to the side of another to counsel or support the one who needs it. And it's translated in our Bibles as helper, comforter, counselor, intercessor, advocate, it means that the Holy Spirit is on the side of the Christian in, in one sense and also inside the Christian in another sense. And, and so on the side means that the Spirit supports us, helps us, and comforts us. And inside, the Holy Spirit dwells in us to make us grow more like Christ and, and keep us fruitful. So it just as one, one, one English word can't quite, quite describe uh, the Holy Spirit, I, I've been told that not one English word can describe all that a mother does. I heard a story that a teacher, a second grade teacher, was, was teaching the students one day about magnets. And all day long, you know, all day long they, they did something with magnets here and there. And then the teacher gave a test. And the first question on the test was, who am I? My, my, my full name has six letters. It starts with M, and I pick up things. And half the kids wrote magnet, and the other half of the kids wrote mother. <laughs> so so I, I got to think about that, that the Holy Spirit as our advocate is kind of like mother in some ways, because I would say this for me and maybe for you, my mother was my advocate. I mean, if something needed to be done, she got it done for me. And she was by my side. And, and she was going to bat for me. And, and the Holy Spirit is like that, advocating for us, standing by our side, so supporting us. And, and also the Holy Spirit is kind of like a magnet, not, not that he's some kind of impersonal force. The, the Holy Spirit is, is the person of God. But the Spirit attracts the life of God into us. And he also, there's that negative side of a magnet, you know, kind of repels. 
that sin and that selfishness away from us. What a helper we have. The Spirit of Truth, our paraclete. God on our side, God on the inside. Teaching, filling, guiding, giving us peace, love and joy and strength and courage and truth to live in this world as we should. So there's the message today. Here's the call of God today to a life of greater love. And and Christ commanded it for his people, this call to greater love. He explained it, that there will be hostility associated with it, and that it is a sacrificial gift kind of love that we give love without strings. And then he said, I'm sending you the advocate, the helper to support you, encourage you, and fill you with this kind of love for others. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we, this would be too good to be true, that, that you would send your love to be at our side and to be in us by this helper we know as God the Holy Spirit. And I pray we would, we would be filled with the Spirit and we would know the, the presence of the Spirit with us and in us this week, giving us the kind of love and courage and truth that we need to live wisely and fruitfully in this world. And Lord, we've failed at love so many times. It might be our greatest failure, the ways that we fail in love. And I pray you would cleanse us and forgive us and fill us and support us by your Spirit that we may walk in love this day and all this week. In Jesus' name, amen.